praise the Lord for the beautiful message and song by the ladies. Would you say amen? If it matters to us, it matters to the Savior. Beloved, thank you so much once again for coming to worship with the great Pasadena Seventh-day Adventist Church. You've been blessed thus far. Let me hear you say amen. amen. The God of heaven is working. The God of heaven is moving. The God of heaven is doing something else once again with no one's permission. We praise God for his blessings upon us. The God of heaven that we serve is very concerned today. Why? Because he's done so much for us and there are still many who do not really want to serve him completely. His heart is broken, but yet at the same time, my friends, he still loves us. He still cares for us. He still wants to save us in spite of how we relate to him. And as we look around in this world today, and especially in his church worldwide, there are only a few people who are true and dead serious from each church. How do I know? Because the word of God says in Matthew chapter 7, around 13 and 14, it says, few will be that find it the straight way. So, beloved, please understand something. God loves you. He loves all of us. And before I get into the message, welcome again to all of our visitors and those who are watching near and far. You see, my friends, the time in which we live, it has become very precious to serve Jesus. To have an undying faith, to have an undying trust in Jesus, in his word. I praise God for the Sabbath school lesson today, done so well, led out by our dear sister, Sister Blakely, thank you so much. My brothers and sisters, we need to understand something. When it comes to trusting where God's church is going to end up, it's like this. It's like buying a plane ticket and boarding that plane and having now the assurance that you will end up where you think the plane will land just because you bought a ticket. Beloved, one day it will be all over. There will be no more sermons. No more prayers, no more appeals, if you please. So let me get straight to the message today. God's message is entitled, Shaken or Sealed. Would you pray with me? God of heaven, thank you for the blessing. Thank you for the warm weather. Cool us, Lord, where we need the cooling. Bind the enemy because we need that steadfastly. Anoint your servant now with your Holy Spirit. Put your words in my mouth. Have your way. Do what you do best, and that is change our hearts and save us in your kingdom. This we pray in Jesus' name. Let everyone say. Amen. Beloved, the question comes to all of us this afternoon. What's going to happen to God's last day church in these last days? This is a question that we should be of vital interest to all of us. It should be vital interest. What's going to happen to those of us now who profess to be Seventh-day Adventist Christians? Just as the plane passenger needs to know if the plane will arrive safely at his or her destination. So we need to discover the final true destination of God's true church. Will it endure until the end? Will God's faithful few need to leave the church in the last days? Many think about that because of all the things that are happening in churches today. Or will now the faithful stay in the church while everyone else leaves? And of course, we do have to immediately agree that the plain illustration is a flawed one. How so? Of course, we do have to immediately agree with that. You see, you don't ride into God's kingdom on the basis of a church membership. 
Hello, do we? Just because your name is on the church roster doesn't mean you have the key to the gates of heaven. You see, it's not automatic that you would end up where you think you're going because you bought a ticket, because you have your name on the church registry. I remember in 2018, my wife and I, we were, we were asked by the conference to lead six young people to go to do an evangelistic campaign, eight evangelistic campaigns. We were going to do one each ourselves, and the six young people were going to do theirs as well. And we were asked, would we go to South Africa for this to take place? And as time went on, my brothers and sisters, we learned at the last few hours or just about even just two weeks, we learned that we had been diverted not to go to South Africa, but to go to El Salvador. Now, many of you know, like I didn't know at that time, that that, that is the most one of the most dangerous places to go on the planet. And brothers and sisters, I didn't learn that this place was so dangerous until the plane landed. And people began to tell me how bad it was there. And I just simply gave up the Lord have mercy. You see, my brothers and sisters, on the way, as we were on this plane, we had the tickets. Oh, yes. And I have never flown on a plane like that before. I wondered if that plane would get us to our destination. Why? Because as I sat in the seat, it wasn't totally anchored to the floor. As I looked at the seat in front of me, even the foam was coming out of the seat in front of me on the sides and threads coming all out. And the plane, let me just make it straight, play, say it straight. The plane was raggedy. The plane was tore up. And I thought, man, will we make it to our destination? Yes, we did. And it's obvious that we made it back because I'm standing here. But brothers and sisters, I wondered, but now as I look at God's church today, I see how it's torn and it appears to be raggedy in some places. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know God has a special plan for this church in spite of what it looks like. The church militant, or let me put it this way, the church triumphant will come out of the church militant. Come on and say amen. You see, my friend, once again, salvation isn't determined on the basis of whose names are on the church book. And yet it is important to know how God is going to use this church in the last days. And we are there. So let us get an understanding of what is meant by the phrase, the shaking, the shaking. Will God's believers be shaken out or will the unfaithful be shaken out? It's an important question to answer. So let's take a look at God's plan for his church in these last days. We need to understand. Let's see if God's church is going to be broken up so that a separate group will emerge. So let's answer these questions. Let's see how God will purify his church. And how will the shaking affect each and every one of us? Oh, yes. And what events will constitute the shaking? And how we can be confident that we're among those who receive the seal of God. Think about it. So that knowing Jesus, we may live forever. Question, do you want to live forever? Church, let's understand that throughout history, we have to understand this. God's church has been subjected to a series now of crises. You see, God's people had often drifted into apostasy. Hello, you see it today. And periodically, they adopted the customs and the practices of the people around them. We talked about that last week. This is especially true of the Old Testament church. Oh, yes. And it is so today with this 21st century church. You hardly can go anywhere and see the purity of the gospel being lifted up with real, true, present truth, my friends. And it is so true. And God called Abraham out from among the idolaters of his day. Why? Because he was obedient to God. God wanted to separate him, you see. God now even called the nation of Israel out of Egyptian bondage to receive and maintain a obedient relationship with him. And you see, when Israel now persisted in disobedience, guess what God did? He allowed them to go into captivity and he also allowed them to face persecution in order to teach them dependence upon him. Too many people depend upon their paychecks. And even in spite of all the warnings that God gave his peoples, my friend, the prophets and, and continue loving entreaties that he spoke through his prophets to repent, even with persecution, Israel blatantly continued in rebellion. What 
Yes, they did. So God called out a faithful remnant who willingly served him. When we come to the New Testament, my friends, it is interesting to note that the word ecclesia, ek means out, ecclesia means called. So the New Testament church was a body of believers now called out of Judaism to maintain a faithful allegiance to God. That's what he did. You see, the New Testament church drifted away from God. Can we relate today? Yes, they apostatized. Pagan practices began to slip now into the church. It was there. They worshiped those images. And of course, Sunday worship now came along. And these human ordinances, which were all signs of growing apostasy in God's church. So God called reformers out of the papacy. And these reformers, my friends, Luther, Wycliffe, Huss, Jerome, Calvin, and even others, oh yes, called out the true believers from now even the main body at that time. But then, as the Protestant churches failed to keep pace with the advancing light of God's word, guess what happened? God again called Bible students out of the Protestantism during the Advent movement. That's why you and I should study the word of God more than ever before. Are you listening? You see, church, whenever the corporate body at large has drifted away from God, God now has adopted the principles and practices of the world. These people have adopted those principles and has not kept pace even with advancing light. Get it now. And they compromise the principles even of the scriptures. God has called out during this time a body of believers. And do not get disappointed or discouraged. God has a faithful people in every church. Can I get a witness? Beloved, there are a multitude of seven adventures today. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Listen up. Who are deeply concerned now as they see certain conditions that's within the church. But I want you to know that God hasn't called us to take a flashlight to shine our flashlight on the darkness of others. He wants us to be an example and teach and preach and tell the truth and love people unconditionally that they hopefully will see the light. We are not to condemn people. Amen. God says, let the sheep and the goat dwell together, the wheat and the tares. And when my angels come, they will do the separating. So what did God do? What did he do? Many are wondering now. They sincerely wonder whether or not God is going to call out. A body of believers from the church, the Seven Adventist Church, in order to purify it. In fact, there are certain movements we often refer to as offshoots, who will shoot you, yes, with their tongues. Hurt your feelings, too. And they claim to be on God's side while they're killing the saints. Come on and say amen. But they have their entire philosophy now based on the idea that God is going to purify the church by calling out a faithful few. So the question comes, stay with me now, what is God's method of purifying his church in these last days? Let's travel to Hebrews chapter 12, 25 to 28. And the word of God gives us counsel here of how God is going to deal with this. And it says in verse 25, see that you refuse not him that speaketh, for they escape not who refuse him that spake on earth. Much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaking, as of the things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Verse 28. Wherefore we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace. Let us have what, everybody? whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. God here speaks about an unshakable kingdom. And here in Hebrews chapter 12, the word of God is talking about, Paul is talking about Israel's experience at Mount Sinai, at the base of that mountain. And God now was delivering the Ten Commandments, and he was speaking the Ten Commandments. And the wind was blowing, and the earth was shaking, and the earth was earthquaking, and you name it. The wind was blowing very hard, and the people became very terrified. And they did not want to listen to Moses and not begin to speak those commandments. Those people became afraid, and they would say, wow. Moses, tell God to stop speaking. We'll listen to you now. They became afraid of him. They were shaken up. And 
He speaks of the darkness and the thundering and the great voice speaking with fear. Then he says here in verse 26, yet once more will I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, if you don't listen to the true word of God through the righteous, true prophet, God is going to get his message across in another way with you through his divine providence that will have to shake you to turn to him before it's ever forever too late. Are you listening now? And once again, yet once more indicates that there was a shaking before God shook the earth around the base of Mount Sinai. Yes, he did. And they didn't want to listen to Moses. But when God began to speak, now they say, we'll listen to you, Moses. Tell God that's okay. We'll obey. You see, brothers and sisters, our God does not want to destroy us. And unless, let me repeat verse 28. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom in which cannot be moved. Let us how we may serve God acceptably. That means that we can serve God unacceptably with reverence and godly fear. That means reverence to God. We have to serve God acceptably with reverence. God doesn't accept any old kind of worship. Are you listening? You see, my friends, the church in the past, God's method of purifying the church has to been, it was to call out a separate, distinct body of believers at that time. But in these last days, what did I say? These days, God uses now a different method. God purifies the church by shaking out the unfaithful. So if somebody gets mad and they want to leave, pray for them. Those who are loyal to the principles of God's word and the teachings of Jesus remain in the church, my friend. God calls them the remnant. John the Baptist echoed the symbol of the remnant when he wrote in Matthew chapter 3, looking at verse 12, where it says, His shovel is ready in his hand, and he will winnow the threshing floor. The wheat he will gather into his granary, but he will burn the chaff on the fire that can never go out. You see, the farmer on the farm, when they have to gather in the wheat, you see, they have to take the wheat and, and, and take it to the threshing floor, and they would throw up the wheat, and then the chaff, the, the chaff will blow away, and the wheat will fall down, and it will remain. That's how they're separated. The wheat is shaken up, but the true wheat will remain, and the chaff of those who are professors of the truth, who are not really serious about God, will be shaken away, or should I say, blown away. And the farmer takes that chaff, and it goes out into the wind. Inspiration counsels us on this, my friends. Second book of Selected Messages, page 380, gives us this counsel. The church may appear as but to fall, but she does not fail. It remains, and guess what? While the sinners in Zion, meaning the church, will be sifted out, the chaff separated from the precious wheat. This is a terrible ordeal, but nevertheless, it must take place. Wow. This is what's going to happen? Why would someone preach a message like this even in the hot weather? Because it's hot time right now, brothers and sisters. It's hot time for us to hear the unadulterated truth of God's word. So clearly God's method of purifying the church today is not to call out a small group who are faithful. On the contrary, he will shake out the unfaithful. And I want to park the car right here on this thought and let you know that building of brick and mortar is not the church. We, as God's people, or the church. Can I get a witness here? Some people are making brick and mortar. Oh, my church. Okay, is that going to be? No, the Bible says that's going to be burned up. God's true church are people who live the truth. Those who have the walking testimony of Jesus Christ in their lives while they live the order of heaven from the pure word of God. That's his church. So if you want to follow an organizational structure in a building, if you please, we need to understand God is going to translate people, not a building. Some people are worshiping the building. And that's going to be their heaven. But God has blessed us to have. I know we wish we were in there with the air condition right now. Right. Amen. But God wants us to remind us of the heat that the times in which we're living in right now. But I want you to know the church will not fall, my friends. It will triumph. We will triumph. Stay faithful to God. Now, this leads us to some more questions. What classes, what groups of people will be shaken or sifted out? And how can you and I be sure that we are among those who will remain? Let's take a look now at four classes. How many classes? Four. Of people that have been identified among those who will be shaken out of God's 
church. Number one, the worldly. What did I say? And the worldly people are going to be shaken out. Those who profess to be children of God and yet they are worldly. They live six days in the world and come to church on the seventh. And the God of heaven says, I don't accept that. And now they are blind to this. And this is why in this great book, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, gives us this counsel. But if our gospel be hid, because there's too many people saying, I don't see anything wrong with it. I don't see anything wrong with this, that, or the other. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, which is Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You see, church, God, the God of this world, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. That's right, people in the church who do not believe. What? Yes, not by what they say, but how they're living. They show that they true not, truly do not believe that Jesus is coming soon by the way they're living. Satan has blinded their minds to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ. Oh, yes. Listen now to what inspiration tells us. Volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 81. It gives us this counsel. It says, those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threaten, imprisonments, and death. In this time, the goal will be separated from the dross in the church. What? Yes. In other words, many will be shaken out by not having a true consecrated relationship with Jesus. Have mercy. And this is why St. Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you, God says, I beg you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. What kind of sacrifice? Some people say, oh, Lord, I'll die for you. God says, I'm not asking you to die. I'm asking you to live a living sacrifice. How? Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, what he's done for us, at least we can do this. And then in verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds. Oh, yes, that you may prove that is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There are things that are unacceptable to God. Let's not get it twisted. You see, giving God our all in all. Right now, we need to do that. But God wants to fill us with his Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. But there's no room for Jesus in our inward heart. As he traveled around with Joseph and Mary looking for a place for him to be born, there was no inn that would make room for him. There was no room in the inn. And it's like with many today who have no room in their hearts for Jesus. And giving all our hearts to God, right now there's no room for Jesus. Why? Because it's crowded with worldliness. Yes. Captivated with sports star stars, TV stars, movie stars, music stars. There's no room for Jesus. And what other type of people will be shaken out? Well, it's the superficial. It's the what, everybody? Playing the games, yes. Looking the part, yes. Notice what it says in 2 Timothy 3, 5. At the end of that particular text, when it goes to verse 5, it says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. God says, don't hang around people like that. You want the power? You don't want it to be shoved away? Don't hang around from those who have a form of godliness. Now, many years ago, I used to think, man, this is, this is talking about the world. No, no, no. The world does not have any kind of indication of a form of godliness. We who are in the church, we have a form of godliness. But, and the problem is, we deny the power thereof, the power to overcome all sin. How much sin? And that is the problem. So here now, once again, God describes these people who are in the church as holding a form of religion, but denying the power that will keep them from sinning. Have mercy. The spirit of prophecy speaks of this class also. Volume 5, and it gives it this way. It says the superficial, the conservative class whose influence has steadily retarded the progress of the work will renounce the faith and take their stand with its avowed enemies toward whom, whom their sympathies have long been tending. Wow. You're superficial? When the pressure comes, just like the disciples, 
They're going to scatter and leave Jesus. The superficial conservative class. This is an interesting expression, isn't it? Well, what's it all about? What is this class all about? They are alarmed at the trends in the church. What's happening in the church? You don't find them sitting in front of the TV for six or seven hours of the day. No, 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 no. You won't see them going into worldly places of entertainment, but they are only superficially conservative. What? You see, they are status quo Christians. Uh Uh-oh. While everything is all right, they say, don't worry. No, no, no. We're on target. We're on target. Oh, no, no, no. Don't rock the boat. We like it the way it is. By all means, though, be committed. Yes, return your tithe. Go to Sabbath school. And don't be so zealous, though. No, no, you're too zealous. Oh, yes. But on the other hand, when you ask me this, I don't have a time to give a Bible study. No, 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 no. I already know the truth. Uh, Everybody else needs to know and find it on their own. Superficial. Don't go too far overboard, pastor. You're talking about going out and witnessing too much? You make too many calls for uh, uh, people to come down during the appeal. Don't be so overzealous. We're in the right church. We're serving on the right day. Oh, 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 don't be so overzealous. We're going to make it all right. And the church is going to get through this crisis of the pandemic. Oh, yes, we will. We'll go back to norm. Don't get it twisted. It ain't going back to norm. We're in the end times. This is the beginning of sorrows, my friend. They always want to be superficial and talk about it. Don't be so overzealous. Uh, 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 uh. Just make sure you're on time for Sabbath school. What? Church is much more than that, my friend. And then they'll say, don't ask me to go knock on doors and do anything extra like studying my Sabbath school lesson even more than I do. No. At least I'm in church every week. Huh? Their prayers, these people are formal and ritualistic. Formal. They only pray now when there is a crisis. They only study the word of God or occasionally. Don't rock the boat, they say. They feel that they know it all. They don't think they have to study the Bible more. I've been in the church for 25 years. I'm a 17th generation Adventist. Notice what the great controversy says to this thinking. Only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusion that takes the world captive. It's coming, church. Now, that doesn't sound like superficial Christianity, doesn't it? Number three, the self-confident. You see, this group isn't like those who are worldly or superficial. And Paul has some very, very direct counsel for those in this class who are. And here in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, the word of God says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You better think about it. You see, the Lord's servant gives a similar thought from the testimonies, volume 6, page 400. A lot of counsel from the spirit of prophecy today. Stay with me. And it says, those who have had great light and precious privileges have not in, but have not improved them will under one pretext or another go out from among us. What? Oh, my. This is serious. It's so serious. It's so heavy. We can't lift it. We cannot allow that to happen to us. Can I get a witness today? These are people now who are standing still, relying now on their present experience, not improving their opportunities to grow in Christ. That's very much needed. They're like Peter saying, Lord, though all men may forsake you, I'll go all the way through the fire with you all the way to death. You don't have to worry about me, Peter said. Oh, yes, I'm confident that when the crisis breaks, when the trial comes, I will defend you. You and I know what Peter did. He denied him. And when Calvary comes, Peter says, I'll be right there by your side. In fact, I've already had my sword ready. That's what he said. You see, my friends, when Peter swung that sword, he wasn't aiming at that guy's ear. He was trying to chop his head off. He meant business then. But when the pressure came, my friends, He scattered, and so did the other disciples. And we might say to ourselves, if we were there, we wouldn't have done Jesus like that. Forget it now. They lived with him for three years plus. 
and yet they had that personal relationship with him. Yet, yes, they saw the miracles. They saw everything. But yet, when the crisis came, they fled. They denied him. They even, one, even betrayed him. That's why you and I, when we pray, Lord, keep us. Help me not to make the same mistakes that they did. And Christ in his mercy, my friends, only allowed an ear to be cut off when Peter swung that sword. He was full of, he was full of self-confidence. But the problem was that Peter needed more than human strength, strength to face the crises, just like us today. Yes, there are many today who are not in the worldly group or in the superficial or even the conservative class. They may even be spending great times, amount of time studying the word of God, even in prayer. Yes, but the basis of their religious experience is themselves. I've come to church every week, 52 Sabbaths in a year. I've been every Sabbath. I'm good. I study my sin every week. I'm good. I do my morning devotions every morning. I'm good. Oh, yeah, all your works. Yes, I'm good. Themselves. Counting what they're doing themselves. We can't get one inch off the ground to heaven by our works, my friends. But because we are saved, we will do those things. But don't ever think just because you're consistent that it's all about what you did. Can I get a witness? And They find themselves believing that no matter what, they will certainly not give up their faith. We all would like to believe that. Oh, yes, Lord, keep us, keep us, keep us. But unfortunately, any individual who puts confidence in his own ability to stand firm rather than in Jesus is like a man in this parable in Matthew chapter 7, looking at verses 21 to 29. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Yes, preach the word, and in thy name cast out devils. Yes. And in thy name done many wonderful works, handed out bread to the homeless. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that worketh iniquity. What, Lord? We did all these things for you? Yeah, it was about you and not me. And therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon the rock. And keep in mind, this rock is Jesus. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house. Yes, and it fell and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus now had ended these sayings, the people was astonished at his doctrine, for he thought, taught them as one having authority, yes, and not as the scribes, weak, no power. Oh, I beloved, if we're like this man in the parable, when the crisis come, and one self-centered experience will collapse. We got to be totally centered in Christ. What do you say? Now, how important is it is for us to learn this? We need to kneel down each morning and admit, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, I know that by myself I'm unable to cope with Satan and his attacks and his temptations. I can't do it, Lord. I know I need Jesus and his power in my life today. You see, church, Jesus wants us to, to lead all of us to be less confident in ourselves and more confident in him, what he can and will do for us and have less confidence in ourselves, our own power, our own confidence instead of his. This is righteousness by faith. Let me move on to number four, lovers of self. Know anybody like that who looks in the mirror every day and says the mirror is not shining bright enough? Huh? Those in this final group lead lives that revolves around self. Yes, they're not willing to make sacrifices for God or his work. Oh, no, 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 no. If it's raining outside, I'm not going to church. Huh? In a description of those people in the church in these last days, 2 Timothy 3, 2 puts it this, uh, this way. Lovers of self, which is at the head of the list. Notice what the spirit of prophecy says. Early writings, page 50. The mighty shaking 
has commenced and will go on. And, we'll all, and all will be shaken out who are not willing to take a bold, unyielding stand for the truth and to sacrifice for God and his call. Still got a lot to go in this sermon, so I'm praying for the Lord to send you some air condition. His cause is spreading the gospel of saving his saving grace to be shared with others, finishing the work he has given us to do. Now, these four categories covers a lot of us in the church right now. Don't get quiet on me. I'm in a boat with you. Come on and say amen. This preacher might be preaching, but you know what? God knows me better than you do. Come on and say amen. I need prayer just like you do, and I'm in the boat with you, and I love you to death. That's why I'm going to tell you the truth today. Come on and say amen. I want to see you saved. So the question comes, how much of the church will these four classes represent? The council is given, volume 5, looking at page 136. Soon God's people will be tested by fiery trials. And the great proportion, great proportion of those who now to appear to be genuine, genuine and true will prove to be base metal. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us. To fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few. This will be our test. The majority will be lost. Have mercy. The majority is going to turn away from God. Lord, have mercy. You see how important it is for us to pray and fast and plead with God every day to hold us. So the great proportion will not remain. They'll be shaken out, my friends. The majority will forsake God's church. I often like to say in many sermons I've done for over the years, most of the people that are in the church today is not going to make it. Most of the people that's going to be saved is not in the church right now. And that's why in that great book, Revelation chapter, he says, hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take your crown. We've got to hold on to what we have. You see, brothers and sisters, this is very serious. Can I get a witness? And there's one thing that I want to share with you concerning this. First of all, we're counted from the pen of inspiration and the Bible, yes, that those who leave God's church in these last days will become the most bitter opponents of God's people, God's true believers. Oh, yes. They will eagerly now take their places as witnesses, even in courts of law denouncing the Christian experiences of those who remain faithful. Have mercy. This will happen during the time of trouble such as never was. Daniel 12, 1. Notice what it says in Matthew 24, 9 and 10. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And I want to park the car on this thought. You shall rise again. Come on and say amen. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. For doing what? For loving Jesus and putting him first. And then it says, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Pray for the church. Talking about people. Now let me move on. Now let's take a quick look at the four agencies that causes the shaking. The four agencies. Number one is false doctrine. Heresy. You see, church, a lot of heresy of false doctrines is floating around in many remnant churches today. Can I get a witness now? How do you know the difference, though? How do we know the difference? Study to show yourself approved. We need to know the word of God for ourselves. And many will accept these erroneous teachings and be shaken out of the church. Oh, yes, as a result. The counsel is given to us from 1 Timothy 4.1, and it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times, last days, some shall depart from the faith. Why? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Got to give you this example. Went into the store this past week, and my wife and I, like many of you, save bottles, right? And you turn them in and get the money and then buy more water, right? And I went into the store, and I got what I thought of water from turning in all these bottles. Praise God. Paid for itself. Get to the cash register and I says, I have seven bottles, seven, seven, seven cases. She rings me up. I get the receipt and I walk out. I load my truck and I count it nine. I says, Lord, have mercy. 
And that devil said, you just been blessed. I said, no, I haven't. I got to go back. <laughs> I got to go back to the registry and let her know I had nine instead of seven. The doctrine of the devil was the devil telling me I've been blessed. And when I went to the cash register and I paid for the additional two cases, the lady says, you didn't have to do that. That was a doctrine of a devil right there. I says, no, no, no. Yes, I did. And I was thinking to myself, I got to preach this week and I want the power there. Come on, say amen. And she said, well, I'm so glad you did that. That was very nice of you to do that, but you didn't have to do that. I said, yes, I did. That was the doctrine of the devil. And many of us are faced with those types of things. And the devil whispers in our ear and he tells us it was a blessing. No, it's a curse. Church, you know what? That's what's wrong with many people in the church today. First of all, they haven't been taught God's word properly. Oh, no, 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 no. Or even correctly. Nor do they even study or even want to in many cases. That's why I'm going to use the word of God and the gift of prophecy for you to check on this preacher so you'll know for yourself. You see, the shaking time has commenced long time ago. You see empty seats in the church. God is making room for those who are going to be faithful. Come on and say amen. That's why people like this are only surface readers anchored nowhere and they are like sifting sand. Prime to be shaken out. So number two, people are going to be shaken out because of miracles, false miracles. You see, Satan will make people sick. Doesn't he make you sick? Gets on my last nerves. Yes. And then will suddenly remove them with his satanic power. If he puts it on you, he can take it off you. Then people will be regarded as healed. These Works of apparent healing will bring many to the test. Volume 2, page 53, puts it this way. Those who are looking for the spectacular and who desire miracles more than the truth will accept this counterfeit. He's priming the minds of many to accept the false doctrines of this one world order and the movement of the Sunday law. That's what's happening, brothers and sisters. Let me move on to number three, which is persecution. A lot of people don't like to stand for God when they get persecuted. You see, this preacher is not invited to every pulpit. Uh -uh. People think when I preach, they're getting persecuted. No, you're getting persecuted if you don't follow the truth. Come on and say amen. That's what you'll end up getting. They say it's hell and fire and brimstone preaching. No, this is what you're going to receive if you don't follow the truth. Hell and fire and brimstone. Come on and say amen. God is calling us, Lord, to stand for us to stand in the midst even of persecution. This will shake out a great number of the church and the great controversy. Puts it this way, my friends, in 608, the storm, as the storm approaches, a large class who have professed the faith and third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. Have mercy. You see, when persecution really breaks those superficial members of the church who desire praise and flattery for the things that they do in the church and popularity will leave. Have mercy. And then they'll leave because of a straight testimony. Can't stand a straight testimony, my brother David. Oh, no. A straight testimony. And that's why it says in 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 4, I charge thee, therefore, before God, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Preach the what? Be instant in season. Even when people don't want to hear it. Yes. And out of season. Reprove. That means if you don't know, I need to teach you or remind you. Rebuke. That means I, when you know better and you're tripping, I need to rebuke you and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Everybody needs to be encouraged. Come on and say amen. Don't worry. You'll get encouraged before you leave. And then for verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves false teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto favors, fables. I want to hear somebody preach that I can keep sinning and still be saved. Won't get that from here. You got to find another address. Come on, say amen. 
You see, brothers and sisters, they don't want to hear the truth, and that's okay. And there are people who will come to you and say, this is not the truth. That's not the truth. Let me show you what the truth is. I am so glad God's unadulterated truth is the truth. No matter what any of us believe, it's going to come out in the wash in the end, and we all will see where we stand. The question is, where are you standing? On the promises of God or just on the premises? Being superficial, not knowing what you believe what time it is for us to know God's truth for ourselves in such a time as this. Thank you for cooling down, O oh Lord. The final cause of the shaking is also revealed in the pen of inspiration, early writings 270. You're still with me? Come on and say amen. And he asked, I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called for the counsel of the true witness to the Laodicean. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it. And this is what will cause the shaking among God's people. People don't want to hear the straight testimony of truth. Talk about love. Talk about grace. Don't talk about nothing else. Well, they got to find another address. If you come in here, come on and say amen. I'm going to talk about love and duty, law and grace. I'm going to give you the balance to walk down the middle of the road, not to be extreme over here and extreme over there, but doing the will of God, being a true walking testimony of Jesus Christ by the life you live and the love you give. People need to be saved, but people need to see someone who is being saved or is saved by living the truth, the straight testimony. What do you say? Oh, the true witness to the Laodiceans is Jesus. Yes. Many are rejecting Jesus and do not even know it. And because, this, because of this, notice what it says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 to 12. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Can't just know the truth. You got to love it. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusions that they shall receive, believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. In other words, if you don't follow the truth, eventually you will believe a lie. Or what, everybody? Now let me move on quickly dealing with the seal of God. Brothers and sisters, please understand. The book of Revelation speaks about two marks. The mark of the beast, the mark of the beast, and the seal of God. The mark of the beast is visibly manifested in worshiping the beast and accepting the authority of the beast rather than the divine authority. Those who receive the mark of the beast will be caught up in false revival. See, whenever there's a revival, there ought to be right next to it reformation, a change, a work to move forward in God's will. False revival is taking place. False worship is talk taking place. People are talking about the Lord, but they're not doing the will of God. They will enforce the mark in an attempt to bribe and coerce and even in prison, meaning the mark of the beast, and ultimately pass the death decree upon those who refuse to receive the mark, the mark of the beast. Sunday worship enforced. But God would have a people, oh yes, who will receive his seal rather than the mark of the beast. Can I get a witness today? These people are not shaken out. They cannot be bribed. You see, they don't fear imprisonment or the threat of economic boycott. I can't eat, so I'm going to give in. No, not me, by the grace of God. What about you? Even the threat of death cannot cause them to be disloyal to God. That's what we have to get to. Now listen, church. If any Seventh-day Adventist Christian, Christian audience would ask, what is the seal of God? The general answer that would be probably given is this. The seal of God is the Sabbath. That, of course, is correct. But let me give you a more qualified correctness. The first thing that I would like to, for all of us to understand is that the sealing work is a process in the life of the believer, not an act, not an instantaneous light switch, if you please. The sealing work begins at conversion and ends when the believer now makes a final decision 
for or against the truth at the time of the National Sunday Law. Enforced. There are many now who look to the seal of God and equate it with the Sabbath alone. Their idea is that the seal of God is something that is stamped on the believer in an instant. Oh, no. Because there's many people saying, though, when I hear this happen, when I hear them say this on the radio about the mark of the beast, then I'm going to jump on God's side. It's not going to work. You have to have a relationship with Jesus all along the way. We are being sealed every single day by every action we do, everything we say that honors God. We are being sealed. We are being marked by everything we do or say in all of our actions when it comes to serving Satan. We're being set up. You see, they think that it's going to happen in an instant. No. When the National Sunday Law is passed, get it now. They think that receiving the seal is an instant, instantaneous act, and that's not the case. Oh, no, no, once again, they don't sense that the sealing work is a process, my friends. Receiving the seal of God depends upon our daily responses to the appeals of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Is this a new thought to you? Huh? Have you been looking forward to be sealed later on or marked later on? Oh, okay. We cannot afford to wait. Oh, no, no, no. The sealing... Character reformers, right now in the light of this process, what exactly is the seal? And one of the clearest references in the gift of prophecy regarding the definition of the seal is found in the great book, SDA Bible Commentaries, page 1161. And it says, just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and and spiritually so that they cannot be moved. A lifestyle, the way you live, it's a lifestyle. Come on and say amen. Believing and living the truth, the present truth of God's word, yes. And the Sabbath is an outward manifestation of that settling into the truth. It's a revelation of the inner experience with Jesus, yes, in which we have learned now to rest in him. Are you with me? Amen. Notice what the Bible says in Revelation 7, 1 to 3. You see, my friends, after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, having the four winds of the earth, that the winds should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Church, God was about to end this world. But he didn't. And if we study the prophecies carefully, we would discover that we are on borrowed time. Borrowed time. We see here in Revelation chapter 7 that the angels was about to let go, yes, of the winds of strife which will usher in a great time of trouble. But God saw all of you who are now under the sound of my voice and listening near and far on the internet that you weren't ready yet. And God said to his angels, hold, hold, hold. My people are not ready. I have to spend a little bit more time to prepare them to be ready before you let go. Praise God, I say. And we see the great time of trouble is just before us. And here are the angels that are commissioned to subdue demonic forces. Oh, yes. Where they can go so far and no further, God says, hold. I'm so glad, brothers and sisters, as the counsel is given, that the devil doesn't have full control over this earth. I should have heard an amen. He can't do as he pleases to us. No, we have to give him permission. He can only go so far. Oh, yes. And if it wasn't for these angels, the devil would have destroyed this earth along with us a long time ago. Oh, yes. And here on record was a time now when these four angels were about to move that that wall of protection would come down. They were about to say, everybody on earth who's calling on you has already chosen you, Lord. And everybody else is not going to change. Leave them alone. Let them go. And somebody now, somebody's angel now, reports back to heaven and say that they refuse the salvation of God. Oh, my friends, don't let that be one of us. Their fate is sealed now. Now in the Bible, Jesus shows clearly who would be sealed. And here in the great book, Ephesians chapter 4, looking at verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. 
Don't grieve the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit says you need to be kind and loving to that person that can't stand you. You need to be faithful to me in regardless of what you think you're having trouble with in your finances. God says don't grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the seal. The Holy Spirit is the sealing agent. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to be sealed. We can't change without the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Don't grieve it, my friends. And that's why he says in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3, where he says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. God says, I'm not going to keep talking to you. You want to do what you want to do? Do it. My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he uh, that also his flesh, and yet in his days shall be 120 years. God says, I'm going to have to cut it short. And that's why in Ezekiel chapter 9, I got to go through this. I'm wrapping up in a minute. Ezekiel chapter 9, looking at verses 1 to 6. This is so serious, brothers and sisters. We cannot, we cannot afford not to understand what's just before us. And this is a prophecy letting us know what is soon to take place amongst those who profess to be children of God. And God says here in Ezekiel chapter 9, looking at verses 1 to 6. And he cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate and lieth towards the north, every man with a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen with the writer's inkhorn in his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. altar. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub whereof, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, go through the midst of Jerusalem, the church, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that's done in the midst thereof. And to the others, he said, in mine ear and hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly your old and young, both maids and little children. Have mercy and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary. And they, they begin at the ancient men, which were before the house. God says, judgment begins at the house of God. Begin, begin at my sanctuary. Begin with the ancient men, meaning the elders. Start with the leaders. Judge them. If they're not right with me, shake them out. Slay them. This is coming from a loving God. How could it be? God has given man all this time to turn to him. And for those who are not going to do it, he is pronouncing such harsh judgment, but none of us have to be a part of this. If we're not serious with God today, if you hear his voice, you can take your stand and be faithful from this day forward. Can I get a witness? And here Ezekiel sees the same thing that John the Revelator saw. John the Revelator sees these angels about to begin. And you have to understand, my friends, what these destroying weapons are. They are the seven last plagues. Yes, that God talks about in Revelation chapter 16. There are many people who profess to be children of God, a remnant Christian, if you please. And the plagues, as the spirit of prophecy says in one place, will be falling on them. These are the seven last plagues. And when probation closes on earth, my friends, right before the seven last plagues, everybody's fate is set. Many houses of worship will be still open. People will still be going to church, pray, even singing, even preaching. Yes, because they have not received the seal of God. They didn't love the truth and settle into it in a lifestyle by the will happen in quick succession. Listen, church, God tells his angels, the one with the writer's ink horn, to place a mark on the foreheads of the, those he wishes to seal. God tells this angel to go and seal the people who are crying and sighing because of sin. They are so hurt because of the sins that are going on around about them and in the church. And they find themselves pleading and praying and agonizing for the lost conditions of the souls in the church and in the world. They're not selfish. They want to see everybody saved. They're not thinking themselves more and better than anybody else who know not Jesus, but they're sighing and crying for the abominations done in the church. That's why we cannot tolerate sin if we're going to make it to heaven. We got to stand true in these last days. If you want the seal of God, are you listening to me today? These people are not talking about people. They're not cutting down people. 
And they're not thinking that they're better, but they're feeling sorrowful. Why? Because they know it is hurting the heart of God for anybody to be lost. Jesus longs to save everybody. Don't you appreciate that? His desire is like our desire, ought to be our desire, ought to be like his. So they are pleading and praying for the lost souls in Jerusalem. The church, yes. So God says, I want you to go and place a mark on the ones who are pleading and praying for the lost souls in Jerusalem. Lost souls in the church. I have a sermon coming up not in too far distance called Lost, called Lost in Church. You don't want to miss that. But now, wait a minute. Then he says to the others in verse 5, 6 of Ezekiel 9, Slay everybody who use my name in vain, not just in a church building. Oh, beloved, that's everybody. Our church, God said to those angels, after my people are sealed, slay the rest. Slay the rest. Saints, at that point, the judgments of God and the wrath of God is going to fall like never before on this earth. And I don't care who we think we are or what safety net that we think we have is going to affect everybody who is not sealed by God. And let me tell you something. Not one person will receive the seal who has cherished sins in their lives. Not going to happen. Think about it. Huh? Not one person who has not cleansed his or her soul temple by the mercy and the blood of Jesus will be sealed by the Holy Spirit. Don't think that God is going to make some special favor for you because you decided to start following him when it's too late. The Bible doesn't say that they were washing their robes. God's saints had washed their robes according to Revelation 7, 14. Well, what happened? They made a point blank decision to follow God when the Holy Spirit called. Yes, I'm not talking about works gonna save us, no, to get us into heaven, no, 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 no. It is when we submit now to the power of God to allow Jesus to live his life through us. You see, church, they weren't trying to get right. They were right with God. You see where we have to be? They had chosen now and surrendered their hearts to God. Oh yes, they weren't dabbling back and forth playing fickle with God like a yo-yo, playing yo-yo with, like they're being so fickle with God. No, no, no. In the church, in the world. No, no, no. They weren't playing that game like many people are doing today in the church. These are they that have washed their robes, the word of God says. Jesus is serious about who's going to populate heaven, the new heaven and the new earth. Nahum 1.9 says sin will not rise a second time. So if you have sinned in, you just know where you're not going. Brother, this is hard, but it is the truth in a how. Come on and say amen. God says it won't happen. And the only way it's going to be an environment where sin will not raise its ugly head again, there has to be an environment where people right now choose to hate sin. Got to do it. Now as I close, as the music plays. Beloved, what are we doing as God's remnant church, true church? Do we really love God and people? Huh? I'm talking about me too. Are we sharing our faith? Huh? Are we sharing our faith in this truth and this truth, warning people of the storm that is definitely coming? Are we? And the only way I have to tell you for us to do this is we have to have Jesus in our hearts. We have to have Jesus in our hearts. You see, God is opening up doors and methods that is not going after the ordinary. He has to. We are outside right now. God has us in the parking lot. But really, to tell you the truth, he wants us in all these streets. Come on and say amen. The average person today is not being saved by people coming to church or an evangelistic meeting. No, 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 no. They are being saved by somebody on the street corner or listening on the internet, preaching the word of God. Yes. Church, let me tell you, it's time for us to understand that this movement is not a religion. It is a lifestyle. It's a what? According to the word of God, we dress different. Don't get quiet on me. We eat different. Yes, talk different. The message is different. And it is sound proof, proof, full proof from the word of God. Yes. In Matthew chapter 7, 21 to 23 speaks more to God's women church than anybody else. 
Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. But church, you got to understand, God is waking up people. There are people coming to our church from near and far, walking off the street, looking for the truth, looking for the hope that God has given us. And he's held these people in reserve. Who, when they hear this truth, they will run with it. They will run with it, burning with fire to tell other people. But sadly, many in the church will be lost because they have the thinking of the Jews of old. Just because they were Jews, that they were going to be saved. Many are thinking today, just because I have my name on the church records, I'm going to be saved. Just because I go to church on the right day of worship, I'm going to be saved. Just because... Or well, because they come to church on the seventh day of the week, yes. Yes, that's important. But it's not the only thing. Remember, I said following Christ is a lifestyle. And we as Seventh-day Adventist people have fallen asleep. These are not my words. It comes from pen of inspiration. The book of evangelism. It says the church is perishing while the church is asleep. This is a solemn message today. Amen. I'll say it. Because we're in solemn time. We're in a solemn time. Because this COVID-19 is going somewhere. And while the doors of probation is still swung open on the hinges of mercy, we all need to make a decision one more time. And that is as a remnant Christian to surrender all to Jesus. What do you say? You're all in all. Yes. Jesus is the answer. Whether you're worldly, whether you're superficial, self-confident, lover of self, hard-hearted against God, his truth, his word, with the enlightenment of the spirit of prophecy. And my last two texts to give you the encouragement that we all need. And Jesus says from his word in Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. There's your hope right there. Praise God. One amen, I'll take that. And in Jude 24 and 25, the word of God says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. You see, beloved, this movement is not riding on the plane, <laughs> but it will land us safely in glory. Just hold on, yes. You see, our Jesus, our Jesus paid it all that we may be sealed and not shaken. What do you say? We have an appeal card that I'd like to read for you. If you're liking the appeal card, just simply raise your hand and you can get one afterwards and fill it out and give it to me or one of our staff. And the appeal is this today. I would like prayer as I reconsecrate my life to Jesus, my Savior. It says, I would like prayer for a personal concern. I would like to receive a pastoral visit. I would like to renew my relationship with Jesus and be rebaptized. Some of us need that. I would like to receive Bible studies in preparation for baptism. I'd like to become a member by profession of faith. Yes. Then the last one. I'd like to have my membership transferred to this church. Your desire to fill out one of these cards, please simply raise your hand. The staff will give you one, and you can fill it out and give it to me afterwards. Brothers and sisters, I want you to bow your heads now as we pray for all of us and our families we represent and many people that we know of in this world that needs God's saving grace upon their lives. I want you to pray for yourselves and them as I lift us all up to the God of heaven. Some of us need to make another decision today, and that is to truly come on God's side, not play games anymore. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, O oh God, thank you for your blessings upon us. Thank you, O oh God, for doing what you do best, and that is to send your power, send your spirit. We ask now for forgiveness of our sins as a church, as a movement, Lord. We have failed you in many ways, but not truly committing our lives a living sacrifice for your cause and your will. We're asking now that you will bless us, Lord, with the power of the Holy Spirit to go forward from this day forward, truly representing you in all things, truly becoming a true walking testimony of your son, Jesus Christ. Bless us, Lord, where we need help, God. 
the areas that we are struggling with, the sinful activity that we find ourselves in. Where we're weak, Lord, make us strong. Where we are running short of belief, Lord, please help us. So we ask once again for forgiveness, and we ask now, even with the double portion of your power, covered by the blood of Jesus, inspired by the Holy Spirit, change us, save us in your kingdom. And we give you the praise, we give you the honor and the glory. And for those who are in the valley of decision, give them no rest, no peace until they decide for you. Before it's forever too late, this we pray in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen, amen, amen. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. Give you peace in your heart and peace in your home. Maranatha, please remain seated as we have another musical selection. <laughs>